Welcome everybody to another episode of the Wrestling vs. the World podcast. If you are enjoying your day, sweet. If not, uh, I don't know what to say about this one for y'all, but this might not be the best episode for those who are fans of Dean Ambrose slash John Moxley because I wanted to talk about his 2016 run because I kept thinking, should I just talk about his WWE title run or should I bring up other stuff too? And I figure, why not go through his entire year because... There are some things in there that are going to also kind of intertwine with this title run that I wanted to talk about in general. So, needless to say, I'm going to preface this by saying, like the episode title should say, this year was underwhelming for him, even as he was champion, and because of one reason. Booking! Yeah, the clear problem that happens all together. So, I mean, like, it seemed like things were going to start all right for him. He was Intercontinental Champion going into the year after winning it at TLC from Kevin Owens. And it seemed like things were going to be well at the Royal Rumble. I mean, he retained the championship against Kevin Owens in a rematch, in a last-minute standing match. And then he took part in the Royal Rumble match for the WWE Championship. And he made it to the final two when he was last eliminated by Triple H, getting dumped over the top rope as a back body drop counter. And Triple H will become champion. Now... After this, about a month later, Ambrose would drop the Intercontinental Championship because a lot of times when they eventually prepare somebody for a main event title run, you gotta lose the Intercontinental Championship first. But here was a th- bit of an iffy issue, was that at Fastlane, we had a triple threat match. Roman Reigns, Brock, Dean, winner gets the number one contender, is the number one contender of the championship coming up at WrestleMania. And of course, Roman won. Now, despite this, Ambrose's matches were a little bit all over the place in terms of win and losses. And even though, like, everybody could tell we were going to get Roman Reigns versus Triple H at WrestleMania, they still had the Roadblock pay-per-view happening in March. Not the Roadblock we would see later on in the year saying Roadblock, end of the line, but Roadblock, which happened in Toronto. Dean Ambrose still challenged for the title, and as predicted, Triple H won. I mean, people could see that from a mile away, so... Fans were not given any reason to doubt Triple H going to WrestleMania as champion. It was pretty obvious what was going on because of the Royal Rumble. Now, because of this also, there was some stuff going on with Brock Lesnar to where they set up a match at WrestleMania 32. Brock Lesnar, Dean Ambrose in a no-holds-barred street fight. Which makes no sense because those two things are separate stipulations that mean the exact same thing. You don't need to combine them two and make people think it's something different. It's just no disqualification, whatever they want to do goes. Just the combination doesn't make sense. Now, the build to this match, I kind of liked because you had some of the stuff where the legend, you had some legends coming up to him saying, hey, use our weapons. And he brought him to the ring like a baseball bat wrap and barbed wire and chainsaw and stuff. Problem is, Brock pretty much decimated Dean to the point where Dean didn't get much offense and he didn't even get to use the weapons. I mean, Brock, like, he would, we would hear about this later on in the Broken Skull Sessions podcast episode that he did later on. But it's just like, this match just did not do any Dean Ambrose any favors, despite the build, thinking that, hey, things are going to get hardcore WrestleMania, and then he gets his ass kicked. Like, this match really deflated his momentum going forward. Like, one match can really kind of deflate things for a guy's character in one way or another. Now, he had some mixed matches, like, I think they tried to capitalize just to slight it afterwards, because the SmackDown after WrestleMania, he wins a, wins a quick match against Tyler Breeze, but that's not going to undo the damage. And after this, he starts to feud with Chris Jericho, because Jericho is doing the highlight reel, and he feel, finds out all the highlight reels canceled. Dean Ambrose has his own talk show, The Ambrose Asylum, so they have a couple of review matches. Ambrose wins the match of Payback, nobody remembers. But then we get to Extreme Rules, and they have an Asylum match, which is basically a black steel cage, almost kind of... I think it's kind of reminiscent to the steel cage cage design that TNA would have when they went to a four-sided ring. And on top of there, you had weapons dangling from the ceiling that could be used as weapons. So you had thumbtacks, you had a barbed wire 2x4, you had a potted plant trying to get revenge for Mitch, which is weird that they did that in the first place. Stray jacket, nunchucks, so on and so forth. And Ambrose wins. I mean, the concept itself is interesting. I think the result, like the match, depending on how people... It's going to be mixed depending on how people feel the match itself. Like, I liked it, but I mean, it could have been better. I mean, but it was interesting to see Thumbtacks get involved for the first time in however long it has been. Now, they also tried rebounding with Ambrose after this because they tried building up to Money Bank because the next night, 
He beats Dolph Ziggler to qualify for the Money in the Bank ladder match. He has some win and loss trades around, like with tag teams and one-on-one -on -one matches there. And then out of nowhere at Money in the Bank, he's Mr. Money in the Bank. When he wins the ladder match against Alberto Del Rio, Cesaro Jericho, and Kevin Owens, and Sami Zayn. Then later on in the night, Seth Rollins would defeat Roman Reigns for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship because, in reality, Roman had to drop the title because he was being suspended for wellness policy violation. The right afterwards, <laughs> Ambrose's music plays, Seth was ready for an attack, turns around, boom, briefcase to the face, cash to the money in the bank, dirty deeds, boom, new WWE champion. Now, this was a bit of an issue. Like, I have no problem with him cashing in the night that he wins the contract. The problem is, they didn't do a whole lot to make, try to be able to fully rebuild his credibility after the squash of WrestleMania. Because, like I said, that match really deflated any momentum they had prior to this. Like, he started Intercontinental Champion, runner-up in the Royal Rumble. Like, he was battling Triple H at the main event of Roadblock, and then he gets destroyed by Lesnar. Like, a destruction... I know there are times where a squash match might not do a whole lot of harm to people, but if you book it in the right way, somebody can still win in defeat, and that did not happen for Ambrose. Especially, like I said, when you look at the build and the execution of the match. And then out of nowhere, he's WWE Champion despite not having a big wave of momentum because of the booking. I mean, would they really think they were going to build a guy to be a credible main event guy after the whole thing with Jericho and the freaking plant named Mitch and all that? Like, it just didn't work for me. Now, after this, it would take him a little while to even defend the WWE Championship on TV because his first title defense did not happen for about another month. Otherwise, he was just having random matches against, like, AJ Styles and The Miz and Kevin Owens. Like, <coughs> excuse me, they were trying to build him up again because it's like, hey, he's the top guy now. But then also around this time, as he was starting to defend the title against, like, Seth Rollins and everything, they revealed saying, hey, Battleground, there's going to be a Shield Triple Threat match. Ambrose, Reigns, Rollins for the championship. But this is also going to have bigger, like, consequences because if Dean Ambrose wins this match... The title becomes exclusive to SmackDown because the draft had just happened. But if Rome, either Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins wins the title, the title goes back to Raw. And this, of course, was Roman's return match and everything after his suspension. Triple threat match, like, it just felt kind of underwhelming. It was fine. But it's just like you would have felt that a Shield triple threat match would have been on a bigger scale than Battleground. And they had to add this little quirk saying, like, that the fate of the WWE Championship and what brand it appears on became important with all this, rather than the fact that, hey, the three men of the Shield are finally having their own triple threat match together, because we got close to it, I think it was like, what, Payback 20, no, not 24, it was Payback 2015, except then they added Randy Orton into the, had Randy Orton in the match to make it a fatal four-way, so finally we were getting a triple threat, and it just didn't fully click. I mean, it could have, but it just didn't feel there. But I mean, Ambrose won, retained, title exclusive to SmackDown, and eventually Raw would get the Universal Championship, sadly. Now, after this, he would Ambrose was starting to struggle to have a legit number one contender because the per, the opponent that he had at SummerSlam was Dolph Ziggler, who just became number one contender, and it just didn't feel like the match had heat. Like, there was no excitement to really build up this match, saying, hey, Dolph could be a feasible opponent, especially after Dolph was just constantly going against, like, NXT guys and just not being booked as, like, a credible guy you can take seriously ever since he lost the world title back in 2013. Because, like, let's not forget, for over a year, the guy was on a downhill, downhill slope with, like, losing everybody and all that crap. And then after around this time is when the interview happens, where he appeared on Broken Skull Sessions with Stone Cold Steve Austin. The, promo, the whole thing was getting awkward. And he critiqued Brock Lesnar for how the match at WrestleMania turned out. And it seemed like Lesnar wasn't invested and like it felt like lazy and everything and that probably was what caused what happened at Backlash because you talk shit about Lesnar management's not going to be happy and then at Backlash Ambrose loses his only WWE championship to AJ Styles and of course I believe if members are right involved a low blow and then after this like I said, he would never become champion again. He would try to bounce around, try to compete for the championship a bit more. He had the triple threat match at No Mercy with that added John Cena, but AJ still won and retained. They had the whole tag team match at Survivor Series, where Team SmackDown technically won, where Ambrose was on the side with AJ Styles, but you have to remember there was also the point where Ambrose helped get AJ Styles driven through the table. 
to was like, yeah, he's a lunatic. He's still going after the champion, even though he's on their side. And then that I think also kind of helped lead into the WWE Championship match later on at TLC, where AJ retained the championship with rip to- with rip tights in a TLC match against Ambrose. Very good match, but this was pretty much the last little full chance that Ambrose would have for trying to become champion again. Then after this, he just started go- trying to go for the Intercontinental Championship afterwards against The Miz. Bill become normal contender again for the title after that. And then 2017 happened. He's just mid-card champion again. So eventually he would be with the Shield again. But it's just like 2016 just... It didn't feel like there was any big plans for him. Because like I said, there wasn't mo- mu- a lot of momentum for him with booking. Didn't feel like there was any confidence. The match with WrestleMania didn't help. The matches with Jericho and the feud just did not get him up to a good level to where he would be felt like he had his momentum back. To be the main event guy, his title reign fell flat. The the whole Broken Skull Session interview and the remarks about Lesnar did not do him any favors. And then he never really rose back up after that, even to any possible level. He had shots, but it was just never there. Like his freaking booking was just all over the place where it felt like they never wanted to make him white hot. I mean, like, I like the character that they had. Like, I got invested a little bit in 2014 when it was just a whole lunatic fringe back... When it went to my only WWE show back in December 2014, the only shirt I bought was an Ambo shirt because I kind of liked the character. But it's just like, after a while, it's just like, yeah, okay, it's hard to get invested when there's just no competent booking there to give me a reason to care. So it's just like, it's kind of a shame. I mean, I heard Moxley's kind of a likable guy. I know he's had a completely career renaissance in AEW. But it's just like this year in 2016 just did not do him any favors. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Let me know what you all thought about Dean Ambrose's run in 2016. And yes, I'm referring to him as Dean Ambrose because that's what he was called in WWE, not John Moxley. That's AEW, y'all. Please get that right. Anyway, if you all enjoyed today's episode, please remember to leave a like, comment, subscribe with the bell turned on if you're watching this on YouTube. Or follow if you're listening to this on any other service that I've got this episode being broadcast on. And I shall catch you all in the next episode. Thanks for listening, everybody. Like, comment, subscribe. Peace out. And good day, everybody.